as far as uh, teaching in this post operative thr x rays concern we have to understand few basic things like it should give us a overview about what different type of orthoplasties we are doing like cemented or cemented or any orthoplasty or a total orthoplasty it also gives you uh, about the various complications associated with thr which can be evaluated on the x ray uh, in spite of lot of imaging thick things like ct scan mri or ultrasound x ray still makes a gold standard in evaluation of post operative thr patients because of the cost because of availability because of the uh, no artifacts seen in the x rays or the, and it has a, it gives you comparative analysis of the patients in a total hip replacement patients when we do a x ray in total hip replacement it gives us idea about the limb length it gives a idea about the vertical or a horizontal offset that in, involves the biomechanics of the hip and it also gives idea about the acetabular inclination and femoral stem positioning in addition some complications which are seen with total hip replacement like periprosthetic lucency or <coughs> um osteolysis or some sclerosis and component failure like fracture and dislocations or periprosthetic fractures can very well be seen in the x rays basic parameters as we know is a limb length which can be a less than 1 cm limb length discrepancy is acceptable and this is important because we have to counsel these patients because this is one of the most important cause of medical legal complications if you make your patient understand pre operatively during counseling ki this are the complications associated and these are your findings and this because education is very important to avoid any medical legal complications post operatively otherwise one centimeter shortening patient can sue you in the court and then things will move in different direction so basic evaluation on the x ray is done like uh, doctor <coughs> like we have seen in pre operative things this this is a orthogonal view which gives us idea about the acetabular antiversion this and acetabular antiversion is a angle made by acetabulum in the with a coronal plane this is 15 to 20 degrees or <coughs> on this view and usually this is required to know because mal positioning of acetabulum can lead to a post operative dislocation which is another important complication in this group of patient now when you calculate limb length you take a fixed point on the pelvis like maybe a tear drop or maybe anterior superior iliac spine and lower down also you take a fixed point maybe a lesser trochanter or maybe if you have a full scanogram then you can take a medial malleolus like we do in the clinical examination and you can calculate the exact limb length discrepancy based on the radiology now we know these basic things already covered in previous lecture where you have we have to see a tear drop iliacal line and lateral wall of the acetabulum and these also already been covered where how the ideal anterior posterior view is to be taken and what is to be seen like here you see obturator foramen is narrow on one side this could be because of some flexion deformity at the hip on that side which can get gradually corrected now acetabular inclination is a horizontal line like iliacal iliacal tuberosity line and then you draw a line angled at the lateral wall of the acetabulum and this angle should be around 45 to 50 degrees this is very important because if it's a horizontally placed cup then it gives you more stability but it reduces the moment of abduction if your acetabular inclination is more than 50 55 degrees that is called vertical acetabulum and that can lead to a dislocation <coughs> now femoral alignment is also very important where you see the stem how it is placed in the distal femur and a vertical line drawn from the piriformis fossa to the along the long axis of the femur will give, give you idea about the alignment of the femoral stem another important thing which you can see here is the tip of the trochanter and center of the femur center of the femoral head will also give you idea about the varus and valgus placement of the stem like if your femoral uh, uh, center of the femoral head goes above the tip of the trochanter line then it can be a valgus and if it goes below it is a varus placement of the stem now here you can see a varus placement of the stem in the image now cup placement we have to compare with, with reference to the tear drop whether it is a 
normal placement of the cup or whether it is a protrusing club or whether it's a laterally placed cup like this we have to compare with the teardrop and the iliohistial line <coughs> now this is a horizontal and vertical offset already we know this will also give you idea about the limb length discrepancy and it will give you idea about the placement of the acetabulum and femoral femoral components Now we have to take a fixed bony points like uh, ischial tuberosity and you have to take a lesser trochanter. This will give you idea about the lateral offset or what, uh, horizontal offset of the femur. And you have to see implant placement as compared to the femoral canal, whether it's a, uh, how much proportion is uh, occupying the femoral canal. Now stem alignment, uh, already we know, and if it is an uncemented implant, then you have to see whether your implant placement proximally porous coated how much is the uh, uh, how much it is occupying the proximal femur and how much is occupying the distal femur and you have to see the tip of the implant now this is a laterally placed acetabular cup where it will increase the horizontal offset and these patients will have a waddling gait or may have some restriction of the movement now cement mantle is important to study the osteolysis normal mantle should be two to three millimeter which is placed between the implant and the bone similarly in uncemented you have a porous growth and which has to be seen in post-operative x-ray and in the serial follow-up if there is any osteolysis less than two millimeter it can be because of the normal fibrous in growth there and if it is more than three millimeter then it is significant and we have to study whether it is because of osteolysis or because of infection or because of some other causes. These are all so called periprosthetic lucency or osteolysis. Basically it is because of the foreign body granulomatosis because of the uh, micro disintegration of the uh, plastic material or in metallosis because of the metal deposits and can give rise to lucency all around the implant. Infection is most important cause of this lucency or uh, osteolysis and it can very well be seen on the x-ray. Sometimes a CT scan or MRI may help you in getting a more information. This osteolysis can be studied like uh, component failure, like because of osteolysis there may be a linear wear of the acetabular cup and which can be seen on the x-ray and this is also because of the plastic wear. Sometimes you see a sclerosis or bone proliferation, it, like uh, you have a heterotopic ossification where bone is formed in the abnormal position. This can be important cause of uh, stiffness or post-operative pain and which need to be evaluated and which need to be treated accordingly. Sometimes spot shielding or a stress shielding where you have osteolysis on one side which is less than 2 millimeter or maybe some new bone formation on the medial side is maybe a normal finding. Periprosthetic fracture is another important thing which can very well be seen on the post-operative x-rays. Uh, this is a Vancouver classification where you can grade and you can, this will help you in deciding the treatment protocols. Prosthetic fracture again important thing if the patient is very obese or overweight then we have to counsel the patient that this can lead to a fatigue fracture of a implant or a femoral stem and if we educate them then definitely it will help you in getting a better outcome. And sometimes virus malpositioning is also important reason for uh, fatigue fracture. Now in summary, these lines are very important and we have to keep them in mind and we have to evaluate during these things. During follow-up, we have to do x-rays in discharge and at 6 weeks and at 12 weeks. This is an important protocol and we need to standardize this thing. Because if patient comes to follow-up every month, then you do an x-ray. That is also not recommended if patient is asymptomatic. If somebody is symptomatic, having some symptom like pain and this thing, then you go for x-ray. Otherwise, standard recommended is 6 weeks and 1 year follow-up. Thank you very much.